Hi everyone, this is Dee Lee. It's been such a long time since I have recorded an uh, astrology video, galactic astrology video after a long summer break. I'm finally back and ready to start taking on some readings um, here um, just to record a getting back to basics video about what galactic astrology is and also going to be incorporating some beginner information about what it, astrology is in general, the natal chart, what evolutionary astrology is. I'm actually doing a presentation for a small group of local people who are interested in this topic. And I figured it would be useful for some people who are just starting to um, get into astrology and how it ties into galactic astrology. So I'm really excited to be sharing the, this information with you all and also live locally um, in my area. So a little bit of an overview view. I'm going to talk a little bit about myself and how I got onto this path. Uh, as a teenager, I always had a love of astrology. I was really interested in sun, the basic sun sign horoscopes, but also people's moon signs. I would sit on Friday night at, on the sidelines or in the bleachers, Friday night football games, just doing people's natal charts. And then through the years, my love for astrology grew read several books, and then finally enrolled in a course um, in more of a traditional astrology. But then through a random book I was reading, I, I heard someone mention galactic astrology. I was like, wow, what is this? I have got to find out more about it. Googled it, immediately was led to Julia's website, and the rest is history. I took her practitioner course and just absolutely fell in love with this modality. And I also, at the same time, was also learning a little bit about evolutionary astrology through one of Stephen Forrest's books, Yesterday Sky. Started to really think about the fixed stars and how much they really tie into uh, traditional astrology through the natal chart, but really became more interested in how they were working with a galactic astrology chart reading. So uh, then I, I became drawn to the path of shamanism and ended up just completing a two-year program, shamanic training program that taught me how to incorporate shamanic healing for myself and others. It has been a wonderful healing modality to get back past a lot of blockages for myself. And now I'm able to share this gift with other people. And I'm going to speak to you a little bit how about how I incorporate this with um, an evolutionary astrology reading or and a, a galactic astrology reading. And I'll be talking about, um, I'll be showing you a sample reading uh, just to show everybody how I go about doing a galactic astrology reading. So um, I am also an artist in addition to being an astrologer. I basically was born with a paintbrush in hand. I've always had a love of acrylic painting, then moved on to oil painting in college, and then um, started to get more recently into the possibility of being, or being a spiritual channel through my art. So I, on my website, also have a section where I am channeling digital works. I do channeled um, oil painting works, but it's really cool how the findings of a galactic astrology reading or a shamanic session can also be tied into a digital mandala that can be used in addition for further healing. Um, and then I'm going to show a couple samples of my latest recent works that were created dig digitally. This one is um, entitled Crown Chakra. This is a, a third eye mandala and throat mandala. I was going through a, a course I just was creating about chakra healing and really felt drawn to creating these digital mandalas to help further help people activate their own healing. So when you look at these mandalas, you're getting downloads to help heal different the different chakras. And this was just another more fun one to celebrate the recent um, fall equinox that we just celebrated uh, a week and a half ago. So what is astrology? Get, get, going to get back to the basics. And astrology is, I couldn't, I could spend lifetimes going over what astrology is. It's just a very basic, basic definition. Um, from Britannica.com, astrology is a type of divination that involves the forecasting of earthly and human events through the observation and interpretation of the fixed stars, the sun, the moon, and the planets. 
Um, a natal chart reading is a blueprint of your personal psychology for your life based on the exact time you were born. I see the birth chart, um, the birth date, time and place as kind of a portal into this earthly ex uh, existence. You'll see aspects of this chart can relate to your past lives on earth and your past lives around the galaxy, uh, your childhood self, your current self, the self you are still becoming. The natal chart is a good place to start to learn about things that need to be healed in your past, um, all these past lives and the patterns that have been occurring over and over again during this lifetime and these past lives. So traditional astrology, or Hellenistic astrology does not pull in the energy of the constellations at all. It has nothing to do with the fixed stars. The zodiac consists of the signs you're probably most familiar with that you'll like find in magazine horoscopes, the 12 signs. And the zodiac bases the signs off of the seasons, not the constellations. So this is the tropical zodiac. So it's purely sun based and it is about um, the signs always being in the same place along the ecliptic. So the tropical zodiac is sun-based and the signs are always set in the same place along the ecliptic, which is the path that the sun appears to take as viewed from earth. And that means that zero degrees Aries will always start at the spring equinox, even though there is um, a concept called the procession of the equinoxes, where you might hear that we are no longer, uh, Aries is no longer Aries and you know Taurus is no longer Taurus because of this procession of the equinoxes. And that was never the case with um, with the tropical zodiac because it's based on the archetypes moving through starting with the spring equinox at zero degrees aries and aries always pulls in that energy of spring and um, the initiator getting things started and it does not matter what fixed stars are behind the sun at that time it's always just going with that archetypal pattern based on the spring equinox starting at zero degrees aries so for people who say um Aries is no longer Aries. It was never that way anyway with the tropical zodiac. However, if you're using the sidereal zodiac, it does pull in the energy of the fixed stars and it can change based on the procession, procession of the equinoxes or the, um, the, the wobble of the earth spinning on its axis. So the shift of constellations will never really affect the tropical zodiac. You have to pay attention to what zodiac you're using. So an overview of what we'll discuss here in terms of astrology, we'll discuss uh, the natal chart, some basic aspects that would be relevant for a galactic astrology reading, uh, like the conjunction and the opposition. And we're going to talk a little bit about what the houses are in astrology. So first, the houses. If the planets are the actors, the houses are the stage, the stage where these things take place. So if you're talking about um, your son in the seventh house, the sun is the actor. This, the seventh house is the stage and the seventh house is the house of relationships, marriage, partners, business partners. Um, so if you have your son there and your son represents your life force, your vitality, your joy, um, what, 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 how you shine in life, then you would probably be really, really, um, depending on other aspects in your chart always, but you would be really a relationship person. Relationships would mean a lot to you. So when we're talking about our astro astro astrological houses, we are really talking about the stage where this planet is performing. So the first house would be about yourself, your appearance, your body, um, your identity or your approach to life. The second house is about money, uh, how, uh, income, your, your, what you value, um, what's important to you. Sometimes this could be related to your job because obviously that's how you make money, but it could also just be what's important to you. The third house is the way you, you're thinking, you're communicating, um, your, you know, how you teach, how you receive information, early education. Also is the house of siblings and your local neighborhood. Uh, the fourth house is your roots, your home, your family, your foundations, um, your mom. It could also be your bloodline and it could be the core of who you are based on that. Uh, so it's kind of like your inner self, your inner world. The fifth house is um, a broad house. A lot of these houses are broad, but it's about love, passion, romance uh, in one hand, but it's also about creativity and fertility um, and if joy and express self-expression or leadership, um, on the other hand, and the sixth house 
is the house of health, but also the house of service and daily work routines. So it might not be your legacy or your, um, what you came here to really do, but it's how it's showing up for you in the everyday life. It's your everyday routine. The seventh house we talked about already is a uh, partnership. Uh, the eighth house is how we, well, it's weird. It's the house of taxes and inheritance. So it can be the money you give away or have to give to others or the money you're getting from others. It can be loans, assets, property, uh, but it also has to do with intimacy, bonding, merging with another, um, how you're sharing with others. Maybe it also can be related to codependency, wh where you're so involved with another that you've forgotten to how to be yourself and, and live on your own. Um, it's also it, it can also be considered um, the house of the of the occult, um, things that are hidden from others or things that were are taboo. And sometimes people see this as the house of death or loss. And I think for that reason, it also has been um, talked about as a taboo place because a lot of times over history, we've been taught to fear death or fear things, fear the unknown. So a lot of times I associate this with that uh, concept of the unknown. And some people could see this as astrology itself, witchcraft, um, things that have been hidden from us over the years. Um, but we kind of can combine that or lump that into the same category, similar kind of category as death, because again, it is unknown where we go after this. And there's a little bit of fear around that. The ninth house, um, travel, wisdom, spirituality, higher education, your philosophy on life. It can be law and religion. Uh, the 10th house is your career, long-term goals, your reputation, your public image. It can also be the house of your father. Uh, the 11th house, groups, friendships, humanitarian humanitarianism, it's kind of the house of the future. And the 12th house could be the house, is the house of uh, the subconscious, also a very, very spiritual house, karma, um, again, things that are hidden from us, but more in terms, not of fears, but of um, the subconscious. So again, fears can be here, but it's a little different than the eighth house, which is more associated with those taboo topics or death. And again, the meanings of these houses are really different based on Hellenistic or traditional astrology versus modern astrology, because in more recent years, some of the modern astrologers started to associate um, the houses with the, the, the signs. And, and Hellenistic astrologers would say not to do that, but modern astrologers do. So some would say the first house is Aries, the second house is Taurus, um, but I would do what works for you. What makes sense to you so what is evolutionary astrology it wasn't until i began to focus on earth and galactic past life readings through the natal chart that i was starting to enlighten myself and others to karmic blockages that have been been really holding myself back or others back at a subconscious level for so long so a lot of people, even if, if they got an, a, a reading from me, they might have been uh, aware of their patterns or things that were holding them back, but they didn't understand why. So this work has been extremely healing for myself in terms of just unblocking things that I didn't really know why they were there. And it's also uh, been helping my clients move forward too with their own heal with their healing. So evolutionary astrology is a form of astrology that uses Pluto and the nodes, which we'll go over what they are, to study the evolution of the soul from lifetime to lifetime. It's not just talking about this life and your personality here and now or what, you know, predicting your future. It's going to talk about how your soul has been evolving over many lives. And some of these lives could be galactic. And what is karma? How do I see karma? Because this will tie into it. Some people might see it as an eye for an eye, um, but... I see karma as being imprinted on your soul in terms of trapped emotions in the energy body and shamanism. We call this an intrusion. It's when you're, you have something happen to you in early childhood or even in a past life. And you carry this with you, you carry this imprint um, over many lifetimes. And sometimes you come back to heal this and learn to see it as a lesson and something you need to grow and evolve uh, out of. And it's not necessarily an eye for an eye, like in a past life, you were a thief. So now in this life, people are going to steal from you. That's not how I see it. So what are the nodes of the moon? We can um, really begin to see how important they are in galactic astrology, but specifically in evolutionary astrology. 
uh, the lunar nodes are two points where the moon's orbital path crosses the ecliptic, which is the sun's apparent yearly path on the celestial sphere. This is from Wikipedia. You can see this little diagram at the bottom here, where this you see the, the sun's apparent path. Um, and then you see the other path of the moon, the orbital path of the moon, and then where they intersect, you have your south node and your north node. So these two celestial points that rep uh, represent a person's fate, destin destiny, or purpose from the cut. Um, the lunar nodes are always in opposite zodiac signs and astrological exam uh, houses. So for example, if your south node is in Libra, your north node will always be in Aries. The north node is associated with growth, evolution, and destiny, while the south node is associated with karma, past experiences, and familiar patterns that can be a crutch preventing growth, as stated in Yoga Journal. So the North Node is where we're headed, where we're, our soul wants to grow, but it can feel a little uncomfortable. The South Node is what we've already mastered, but um, now we're we're so familiar with this way of being that it's becoming a crunch, crutch and crunch, kind of preventing our growth. Um, eclipses occur when the moon reaches these nodes and is in alignment with the sun and the earth. So eclipses are really important times for healing this karmic energy. What exactly are the fixed stars? So we already talked about how they have nothing to do with traditional uh, say, uh, tropical natal chart ast astrology. But now more recently, especially after um, Julia Balaz created her galactic astrology website and course, more and more astrologers are considering um, the fixed stars and how they can work in a traditional natal star chart. More and more, um, even, you know, other astrologers are considering it. And for, for galactic astrology, it is really important, basic, a really important concept to be used um, in determining the galactic astrology report. So the fixed stars are stars that appear to remain stationary in relation to each other in the night sky, as opposed to planets and comets that appear to be moving slowly, according to Wikipedia. Although they appear fixed, fixed stars actually move across the night sky. Um, they do move slowly and they move about four minutes. They move about four minutes earlier each day. And the difference in time can be significant over a course of a month, according to universe to go. Uh, ancient sky gaz gazers connected the stars into figures or constellations, which are still recognizable today. Note that the constellations should not be confused with the zodiac. So along the path of the sun, the ecliptic, there are 12 zodiac signs, also known as 12 constellations, sharing the same names. Aries, Taurus, Gemini, Cancer, Leo, Virgo, Libra, Scorpio, Sagittarius, Capricorn, Aquarius, and Pisces, according to Time Nomad. But there are a total of 88 constellations in the sky, out of which only 12 of these are considered the zodiacal constellations or sun signs. And this is because these are the constellations which, which lie across the, the ecliptic, the apparent path of the sun as viewed from the earth. So in other words, it can be said that the sun appears to reside in these 12 constellations throughout the year as earth revolves around it. So fixed stars though, they can come from the zodiac, these 12 signs or the 88 other constellations. So we are not just pulling in stars from the zodiac where we can use the other 88 constellations in the sky. So what is, a galact what is galactic astrology? So Julia Balaz is the founder of galacticastrology.com. And for many years, um, Julia Balaz was a QHHT, regression hypnosis therapist. And she was beginning to make a connection between some of these regression sessions where people were explaining these extraterrestrial lifetimes that did not seem like earth. And she began to take, do a lot of research and make connections between some fixed star alignments in the natal chart. And people were sharing the same stories who had similar, you know, planetary alignments with these fixed stars. So she began, began to take notes and realize that a lot of them were explaining the same similar situations or places based on where, where their fixed stars were aligning with their planets. And she developed an amazing course to go into great detail about how this modality works. This is just a really quick lesson for beginners 
who who would like to learn if if you know this is something they'd like to tap into more just for their own knowledge so Galactic astrology uses one's intuition first to tap into these galactic connections. Intuition is is taught to always be trumping everything else. So if you find an alignment uh, of a planet to a fixed star, but your your intuition is saying that doesn't seem right right now for this person, then you move on and, and you don't really connect with that connection. Perhaps maybe it's just not meant to be shared with the client at this time. Uh, galactic astrology uses the natal chart and how um, planets and points connect with fixed stars in order to connect more to past lives. So we'll be going on about that. We'll be going into more detail about that shortly. Um, it also uses house and sign connections to make interpretations as well. So we're looking at how planets and points like the nodes line up with fixed stars to connect to past lives outside of Earth. So some past life indicators. Not all connections in the natal chart are equal and not all signify a past life. So one of the major things in the chart is the conjunction. Um, the conjunction is when a planet and a fixed star are within two degrees of each other, and they can, this in, can indicate a past life based on this fixed star planetary conjunction. Another really important one that can indicate a past life is the opposition. This is when a planet and a fixed star are directly opposite each other on the natal chart. And then again, there are some other connections that can be made via other points, um, other aspects, but they can still indicate a past life. Again, intuition always, always comes first. And the order of the planets matters. So a fixed star conjunction or opposition to Pluto, way far out there in our solar system, indicates a past life way back to your origins. So if you want to see where Pluto it's kind of like how Pluto is far out from where we are. It's also indicating if you have a fixed star conjunct or opposite Pluto, that this is way back in your timeline in back to your origins or close to your origins. Whereas a connection closer to earth, like the sun or the moon means a more recent life. But again, intuition trumps. Um, so it's important to pay attention to that first, the intuitive stuff coming in. So when I do um, a galactic astrology reading, I would like to let my intuition, again, come first. I do a shamanic journey and I see what is coming to me in my mind's eye before I even look at the astrology chart. Then I will take my pendulum and I will douse. I have a lot of charts um, asking questions like how many earth lives has this person had? How many galactic lives had versus how many galactic lives they've had? I want to find out if they're more an earth soul or a galactic soul. And then I want to find out, you know, were more of their lives on earth in 3d or were more of them like high, higher, um, etheric lives in earth, like in Lumaria or Atlantis. So I can really get a bigger picture of if this is like a truly more 3d soul, or if this is more of a higher etheric soul who spends more time in a light body, but is coming to earth for the first time now in a physical body. Cause this can really explain some of the challenges that someone could be facing. Then I start to dig into the galactic chart. And at the same time, I also look a little bit at their regular natal chart to see about, think about how some aspects in their natal chart would be af affecting their galactic chart. So pulling up um, the galactic astrology chart, it looks like this. And this is where I start to use, uh, after my spermatic journey, I start to use a pendulum to douse. And I'll say, all right, let me look here at Pluto. We start with Pluto. I don't see any conjunctions or oppositions. So I'm going to ask, is there a past life connection here? And if the answer is no, then I will move on to Neptune. And I still at Neptune, I don't see, because Neptune would, would represent our next most ancient life or possible origins if there were no connections to Pluto. Still, I don't see any conjunctions or oppositions. So I'm getting a no with my pendulum. I'm going to move on to Uranus. Okay, I see an opposition here. Uh, Lyra constellation, Vega, is op opposite Uranus. Uranus is in Cancer in the 11th house. Okay, I douse. Is this a past life for this person? Yes. All right. They had a past life in Lyra, Vega. I know that's a starting point. However, then I start to say, but was this their origin? Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. So again, that's where I'm trusting my intuition. Then I'm moving on to Saturn here. Saturn, um, so Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto would signify more ancient lives. 
whereas Saturn and Jupiter would be more, and Mars and even Venus would be more recent or more mid mid road lives. But I'm looking at Saturn. I see a conjunction that could be a past life. I doubt. I got to know. Maybe there was a past life there, but it really isn't significant. Maybe there wasn't a past life there, even though it's showing up as a conjunction. So I'm moving on from that. A galactic astrology chart would take a year to deliver if we were to really go over every single fixed star uh, connection. So we want to just focus on what's truly important for the client at this time. Oh, so then I go to Jupiter. Jupiter uh, has a conjunction um, with with Capulus. Is this a past life? I got a yes. So I know that this is a significant past life for this person. And then I'm moving on to Mars. Uh, Mars is in Scorpio in the fourth house, conjunct uh, Beta Centauri. Was this a past life? The answer was yes. So you can see how this process goes, how we're eliminating some of the um, even conjunctions and oppositions. And we're asking what is really important for this client to know at this time. It's important to note that the conjunction often will represent a past life where the energy is now in this lifetime, easy to incorporate or to embody. Whereas an opposition could mean that there is a little bit of karma there or energy that's challenging for you to really um, work through in this lifetime. So they do have, there are differences between the con conjunction and opposition and how they turn up in your life, karmically speaking. But when we're doing a, um, galactic astrology printout, you can print out this really simple chart that basically shows you only the conjunctions and the oppositions. And you can just easily go down in dows and say past life, past life, yes or no. And here you can see I've outlined where the past life start past life started for this person above Pluto where this red line is drawn. Sometimes the planets here, Lilith, Chiron, or um, even the point, uh, the vertex or the part of fortune, which are not planets, they're points, they can signify a, a past life connection, an ancient origins connection, if you see a conjunction or opposition further up somewhere in the chart. So getting to my sample reading, I did a shamanic journey, and what I saw for this person's sample reading was this swirling green snake-like energy, and I was tapping into the fact that this was their first 3D life on Earth. And they were a scout for the, she was a scout for her home planet. She came here to test out the waters. Um, some of the people or the beings from that planet want, they want to come here, but they're not really sure they're ready to yet because it's such a dense place to be. And they're kind of sending her and she's reporting back to them subconsciously, but she has gotten caught up in the heaviness of being here and being in the 3d body um, because she comes from a non-physical world with many elementals and light beings. This feels like a heavy place for her. She's kind of developed a fear from being here and has a little bit of uh, some health issues she's experiencing from this. But she's here to heal karma from this life that she's, that she's accumulated from being here. And also she's here to heal galactic past lives. She's actually had more lives in the lost, land, lost lands on Earth. Um, Lumeria and Atlantis. She was here pre-Lumeria, even pre um human. I mean, before any humans were here, before Lemuria or Atlantis, you know, civilizations were, were forming. So she really is an old soul who came here, but in more of a higher form, not 3D, and been here for a long time. But again, this 3D body is kind of holding her back. Um, she has she has so many lives out in the galaxy, but less in 3D and more in the higher etheric states. So I started to ask, what is this snake energy all about that I'm sensing? And it kind of appeared to me like the Chinese dragon um, with a little bit of gold flex. And I, again, didn't, hadn't looked at her chart yet, but I saw that um, when I did look at her chart, this energy was kind of spanning several lifetimes, almost like parallel lives happening all at once. And it was this snake elemental energy, the serpentine feminine energy, and when I looked at her chart, I saw that it was spanning Cancer, Leo, and Virgo. And it also happens to be where a lot of her um, planets are in her, in her natal chart, her traditional natal chart. So it was interesting because the connections that I made with the pendulum, I, I, was, I was able to sense that a lot of her connections came before that first one that showed up in the natal chart with Lyra. So I was like, I think there's more here to this person. Lyra wasn't her first ex experience. So what I was sensing was Procyon. 
she was her energy was near there in cancer she had a parallel life in hydra which is in leo and also she had um another fixed star that was coming in 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 the ursa major our uh, big dipper constellation in virgo so it was it's a random star that i didn't even hear of before i had to do a little bit of research on it i won't get too much into that now but what i thought was important was that her, her star her origins out in the galaxy with this elemental snake energy was all in the same area uh, cancer uh virgo and leo but also those are where most of the planets are in her natal chart so i i thought that was really interesting that I feel like she's here to heal from this karmically, but also, you know, those, those signs are so important to her in this life. And we'll get more into that. But when she first started, she was starting out as an 11th dimensional being, and then she was stepping down gradually. Then she went to nine, the ninth dimension as this elemental energy. And this was long, ancient, ancient history, ancient history. If we're using the timeline of the galactic wars, and when we talk about the Lyran, Lyran wars, if you don't know about that, there's this uh, theory that life in our part of the galaxy started in Lyra. And then when beings were evolving there, wars started to break out. And a lot of people in uh, doing a galactic astrology readings will, will, use the Lyran Wars kind of as a reference to determine when something is happening. Oh, is this a lifetime before the wars, during the wars, or after the wars kind of thing? So we can see that she's ancient. She's here as this energy before the wars. And again, here's the natal chart where you can see so many of her planets showing up in um, mainly Leo, a little bit in Virgo, but also in Cancer. And that is where these first three stars showed up for me when I was using my pendulum to doubt where her origin started. So I think also being in the 12th house with the South Node also in the 12th house, we know also Pluto in the 12th house, we know that this is really connected to karma and she's here to heal from this. So when I go to back to that Lyra connection with Uranus in the 11th house, Cancer opposite Lyra in the fifth house, Capricorn, I'm tapping into this first life that we can pick up based on the chart in Vega. And again, this, this is happening in ancient history before the galactic wars. It's still the snake energy. Now she's stepping down though. She's into seven, the seventh dimension. And we're dealing with the fifth and the 11th house. So this can be um, a self energy being the fifth house versus the collective or group kind of vibe. Um, the house of your own personal joy versus sacrificing for others or serving others. So what I got from her, this reading was that she was preparing for the arrival of humans to actually becoming the 3D bodies to be starting to walk on the earth or the, the Lyran planet. Um, so she lives in peace and nature as this elemental energy, harmony, balance, feminine flow, but she was about to witness a radical change as humans would start to evolve on the planets where she was living in the higher dimensions. And this would be indicated by a great shocking change for her because we're talking about Uranus here. This is an opposition with Uranus and Uranus can often bring change, revelations, shock, uh, trauma. Um, it can also be the start of your life purpose though and your mission. So as we move to her next step down, we're talking about, you know, the next step along the, the timeline, if you're going, you know, from way far back to more recent, we have uh, Jupiter. Jupiter is in Taurus conjunct Capulus in the 10th house. So we're, we're in the Perseus constellation. Am I saying that right? I hope. Uh, when? This is after the wars have started. So we're seeing how it's like mid, mid timeline. Uh, who? We have a higher density, higher density planetary humanoid but still 60 so we're stepping down she was able to like be quasi embodied partial crystalline form uh, on her way to becoming more 3d but kind of going back and forth between that light body and that more humanoid form why did she go there uh, there were many races around this star system some were peaceful others were not they were colonizers they would head out via space travel to other worlds you know they wanted to conquer they were interested in science and learning new worlds. Um, but she was here to bring order in this chaotic place from the, the higher realms, kind of like a spirit guide for these humans walking on earth. And she shows up in this lifetime. You can see that this is a conjunction. She shows up in this lifetime still as a spirit guide 
She is hosting many workshops, spiritual workshops, bringing people together in the community, sharing information. So you can see how this was her work, her legacy, her career back then in the 10th house, but more so in a physical, like Jupiterian, higher law, spiritual law way. Whereas now it's here on earth in the 3D and she's showing up as a spiritual teacher for others, still bringing in that Jupiter 10th house energy. As we move on to Mars, we have Mars conjunct Beta Centauri in the fourth house Scorpio. We, um, when is this happening? Again, after the wars have started. And now I'm tapping, I was tapping into an aquatic humanoid, service to others being. And so as she's stepping down, she's still serving others, serving the lights, not, not self-service or, you know, not a dark, darker being. And why was she here? So this is where she saw a lot of war. We're talking about Mars. We're also talking about Scorpio. So things can, things can get deep, intense. Uh, we're talking about the fourth house. This can be her home, her family, her roots. Um, but what I got was that her homeland was invaded. The stories about Hadar do, do tell that story that um, they were invaded uh, by, by an outside group coming in. But she, when she was experiencing this, she was see, experiencing terrible atrocities. Uh, so, you know, she is really here to heal this loss, find her roots again in a 3D form, um, find her connection back to source while living in a chaotic world as we can sometimes experience here on earth, especially as we're moving out of three, the third dimension. Um, so these star seeds that come from Hadar, they, they are very empathic. Uh, they're masters of spiritual evolution. They're, they're healers, galactic travelers, um, capable of time travel and manipulation. Uh, they saw peace on their homeland. And then a lot of them experience peace turning to war and destruction and loss. So she's really healing from that, that moment of loss and how it, how things turned out after that. This is also connected to her South node, which I'll talk a little bit more about later, but she was more just to paraphrase that she was born as a leader in this lifetime into a prominent position, a prominent family. And she had to make some really serious decisions that still feel like she's healing from um, some of the, the, the decisions she had to make based on this. The next step down is her moon. Her moon is conjunct Orion in the 10th house, of Gemini. Um, when was this happening? This is when Orion was ascending from third dimension to the fourth dimension, very much so like we're doing here on Earth. And this was more recent times in her galactic history because we're talking about the moon. So her soul chose to go to war-torn Or Orion, Right when they are on the verge of just of ascending into fourth dimension, the fourth dimension, she had a really hard time in this heavy density, uh, and she would take breaks and leave this lifetime, come kind of popping in and out, and go back to Procyon, and um, it's almost felt like she couldn't handle the pressure there, and she decided to leave. But she's here again on Earth in during a similar time to again connect back to source and oneness and wholeness and finding herself at home here during a time of chaos. So the Orions, they healed in one timeline, they were able to ascend, but in a lot of souls who didn't want to, to finish their healing then and there, uh, chose to come back here to earth to finish kind of that karmic pattern. So we're gonna talk a little bit about the nodes now. The South node, um, according to Stephen Forrest, the South Node primar primarily represents unresolved wounds, tragedies, limitations, and failures from the past, which potentially interfere with our ability to fulfill our soul contract in this lifetime. So basically, when I, an overview of the story I got from her nodes, and I'm going to tell you that first and then go and break down how I, I got there. Um, so this is talking about a, a galactic life connected to... Um, Capulus in the Perseus constellation or Centaurus, uh, Hadar in, in Centaurus, because the South Node is connected to both of these places. She was birthed into a noble family. She was kind of coddled by this, um, but she had to act a certain way in front of others because her family was really well-known and recognized 
but this was too restrictive for her soul. She didn't really like this. She didn't have the freedom to be who she wanted to be. Her father, could have been her mother, whoever is the leader in the family during this time period in this planet, died at a young age when she was young. Her father died or her mother died when she was young. And she had to take on the role of leader at a very young age before she was really able to be mature enough to make these decisions. And she had to make fast and hard decisions. Um, on her hands, there was war, there was bloodshed, there was loss. It was not her fault. It was just the life she was born into. She felt alone. She had to follow along with the laws that other had or others had already laid out before her. She was in the spotlight. This was like her lineage. Um, she was not really revolutionary in terms of breaking out and making the changes that she felt needed to, she needed to make. She just kind of followed along with what she thought was expected of her. And, but she did her best. She did, did, did her best given her age. And, you know, she's just here, here to peel from this karmically in terms of how she can be a leader now. So, so there's a part of her in this lifetime that yearns for this fame and this recognition, but she, she has fear holding her back based on how it turned out in this, these past lives, these galactic past lives. And she also knows that her soul really wants more freedom. So if she's going to be a leader, she's going to do it in her own way. So her south node is in Leo, the sign of the leader, the ruler, the apple of someone's eye, um, the lover of, of the spotlight and attention, fame, glory. You can see how this is playing out in the story I just told. The house is the 12th house. She felt isolated due to her position. The 12th house can lead to isolation, um, feelings of, of loss, illness, grief, secret society, mystery school. So she was on this pedestal, yet she felt alone. Um, and she, you know, we see that she experienced a lot of loss because of the loss and the evasion of her planet. Um, conjunct the south node we have pluto so right next to the south node is pluto this further represents tragedy lost terror violence you get the point something bad happened needs to be healed from the sun is also conjunct the south node so this brings mass gravity to her her personality others look to her she was luminous she she was a leader we already talked about that mercury mercury is also conjunct the south node that it mercury can in, in, uh, indicate fast action things that move really quickly the ability to talk and communicate quickly but it can also indicate a, a situation that happened during youth and it's not always a good thing because we're talking about the south node the south node is something to heal from karmically the ascendant is also conjunct the south node this can signify having to do something alone it is the house of self. You felt like you had to make decisions and take charge. You were the loner. You got it done. You couldn't depend on others. We can see how this ties into her story. The ruler of the South Node for her is Leo in the first house. So this, I'm sorry, the ruler of the South Node is the sun in the first house, Leo. Again, we're just bringing more of that Leo energy in in the first house um, in terms of leadership and being in the spotlight. And this, again, conjunct or um, the, the Ascendant being conjunct, the South Node, it's a, a more of a karmic tie. So what other planets or stars are in aspect to the South Node? These are forces that acted on the person. Um, they're like most likely outside events or people that contributed to the challenges she was facing. So we have Mars square the South Node. Mars in this case, it can be war crimes, bloodshed, violence, and loss, left feeling powerless, fear, resentment, even the fear of anger, other people's anger, other people's uh, war crimes committed against you. And healing really comes for her in terms of taking her power back, rising above negativity and becoming that inner warrior, that inner spiritual warrior, that inner sense of self that she needs to connect back to, being really brave and strong in this lifetime. Also not fearing anger, um, not fearing expressing herself when needed, um, when something something is warranting that expression of anger. Centaurus is square, the south node, and also conjunct Mars. So this, again, we're talking about that lifetime where she lost her home and the, the destruction that she witnessed. It really ties back to that Centaurus life. 
Jupiter is square the south node. So someone or something is in authority over her, being part of a larger system that has power over her, feeling like a victim of circumstance. She can't make real, real choices. She has to follow something else's lead. Even though she's the leader, she's following something else's lead. Someone else's lead, something else's lead, a system that she's in. Pursue square the south node and conjunct Jupiter. Um, again, just this is how I tied it back to that lifetime where she was in Capulus and was experiencing um, experiencing the people who were in 3D walking on the planet where she was and things kind of spiraling out of control and, and her feeling like she was trying to spread this mission of love, but it was really hard to do really hard to do in a place of, that was leading more towards the darkness. So in this lifetime, that could show up as a fear of people's darker actions, a fear of darker magic, or, you know, things spiritually that are a little bit scarier and what might, might turn somebody off from this path, or um, just being more in a dualistic mindset, like good versus bad kind of thing. So she also has some trines and sex styles to the South Node. And these could show up as supportive people or circumstances. But because it's the South Node, these situations might have supported um, her to become a version of herself that wasn't really for her best interest. So if we're sextiling the moon, this could represent your tribe, your clan, your family, your nation, but it held you back. So we, we talked about where, how she was coddled. She, she failed to grow. She was um, born within... Um, a noble family or a system of rules based on the nation where she was, where she couldn't really break free and be who she wanted to be. It was too restrictive. The sextile to Neptune can represent spiritual beliefs that were making her be restricted, restricted or held back, um, a sense of isolation or denial, a sense of escapism. Um, yes, yeah, so you can see how this, this is really tying back into that same story that I tied together through the South Nodes. Well, if we're looking at the North Node, the North Node is, the North Node resolves the problems of the South Node and represents new and unexplored territory for this person. It represents the person's evolutionary intention and soul contracts. Um, due to inexperience, the person will often feel awkward in these areas of life or will avoid it altogether. So it's a challenging placement um, in terms of growth, but it's where you're meant to go. It's what you're meant to step into. And all of this comes from Stephen Forrest's wonderful book, Yesterday's Sky. So her North Node is in Aquarius. This just further says that she's meant to do what her soul wants to do in this lifetime. She is supposed to be free and authentic. Even if she comes off as a little stranger, the outsider, she's supposed to step into who she really wants to be. And... Her, south, her North Node is in the sixth house. So she's supposed to get back into her body, be more physical. Um, this could look like health and exercise, mental health, um, physical self-care. But it also could just represent really being in the body for the first time in, in a less like higher etheric lifetime, but more of a physical one and learning to, to adapt to that, learning to evolve in, in a more dense human form. But she's also here to serve others. So whatever she's doing in this in six houses, the house of service, part of her lifetime here is to help others. The planetary uh, ruler of the North Node um, is Saturn in the second house, Libra. So we're talking about the second house. We're talking about tapping into doing what, she, what matters to her, staying away from things that don't matter to her, that she does not value, and only doing what is really important to her. Um... And just to live a balanced life, you know, make sure she's carefully weighing all her options and thinking of thinking things through before she jumps into making any rash decisions. And I think that will really help aid her in um, leadership roles that she might pursue in this lifetime. So that was just a brief uh, overview of a sample reading. Uh, but next, I'd like to talk about what I would now do with um, in terms of shamanic work to help heal this. So. Shamanism is an ancient healing and spiritual practice used worldwide, comes from many ancient cultures around the world, one of the oldest forms of healing. The shaman typically enters a trance state to talk with spirit helpers, either in the lower world, the middle world, or the upper world, and it brings back um, divination 
for knowledge, healing, very powerful um, in terms of moving past blockages. And I would use shamanic practices along with other services um, being offered. So I can use it as a standalone session just for shamanic healing, but also I can look at the galactic astrology chart or the evolutionary astrology chart and see what needs to be healed karmically based on those findings in the chart. So one of the things shamans do is they command the second attention. When a shaman commands a second attention, he or she is able to rewrite old agreements, which are false belief systems that have been holding someone back in this life, past lives, galactic life, past lives. These agreements um, sometimes show up really strongly in early childhood if it's coming from karmically from a past life because you're being reminded over and over again, hey, you might not know why, but this needs to be healed. So it could be a situation that just comes from you from your childhood memories, but is even coming from way, way earlier in terms of past life karma. So what we want to do is rewrite these old false belief systems and form new agreements that are more healthy. But sometimes in order to do that, a shaman has to inform, uh, perform an extraction. So when emotions are not resolved, they can become stuck in the energy body of an individual. These stuck emotions are called intrusions and they affect the healthy flow of energy in the energy body, leading to weaknesses, holes, and tears. Intrusions can influence the mental, emotional, and physical, and spiritual well-being of somebody. The removal of these intrusions in shamanism is called ex extraction. During this process, the shaman travels to non-ordinary reality to meet the spirit helpers that are able to help remove the intrusion and, and restore a balanced flow to the energy body. I believe um, intrusions can um come from past life traumas again and once that trauma this trauma again is sometimes sent early in this lifetime to re-trigger that memory from the past life so that it can be healed so it can be its own fresh new trauma for this lifetime but can also just be a recurring memory coming from in from past life karma and the shaman also can do a soul retrieval. Um, soul parts are bundles of life force energy imbued within our consciousness. And soul loss happens when soul parts move away from a person's energy field um, as it exists in present time. And often due to a traumatic or upset, upsetting experience, soul parts will remain stuck in ordinary reality, but in an old timeline where the event occurred. So this may look like part of your soul remaining in your childhood home or something upsetting happened as a kid. Soul parts can also escape to non-ordinary reality realms of the upper world and the lower world. And when soul parts are lost, we, we leak our life force energy back to the time and the place where the event occurred in hopes of resolving these difficult emotions. Sometimes soul loss can happen when we are hesitant to leave a positive place, person, or experience. So maybe we loved our childhood home and we don't want to leave there and we're leaving soul parts there because we want to cling to that. But anyway, in order for us to feel whole again, we must call all these lost soul parts back. I also believe lost soul parts can be stuck in earth past lives and galactic past lives. So this is just another service. In addition to other services offered on my website, um, these are just a few services that I offer that would be relevant to um, healing some of the karmic findings in a galactic astrology chart reading. So how to reach me, my website is dlkevolve.com, or you can shoot me an email at dlkevolve at gmail.com. All right. Hope to hear from you soon. Thanks for listening. Again, my credits for a lot of the information I um, shared comes from Yesterday's Sky by Steve Fa Stephen Forrest and The Prism of Lyra by uh, Lisa Royal Holtz.